Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah everyone. So I'm just going to be introducing the Shaykh and the topic he's going to be talking about. So alhamdulillah, he did get out of the elevator <laughs> safely. <laughs> so the topic of the halaqa, the name of the halaqa is decolonizing the Muslim mind. So Shaykh Dr. Shadi al-Nasri will be talking about how Muslims in academic and professional settings can uh, maintain their Islamic source of ethics in the face of secularism and modernism, and how they can also fortify their faith in these settings. So, inshallah, we'll start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala. Allahumma salli salatin kamila, wa sallim salaman tamman, ala nabiyin tanhalu bihi al-uqat, wa tanfarij bihi al-kura, وتقضى به الحوائج وتنال به الرغائب وحسن الخواتيم ويستسقى الغمام بوجه الكريم وعلى آله أما بعد uh, First of all, thank everybody for uh, waiting patiently for us uh, We didn't really expect to be any more than 15 minutes late uh, So thank you all for that It's now 7.05, so we're 65 minutes late uh, But here we go This subject matter of decolonizing the Muslim mind I want to approach it in a slightly different way so, the meaning of colonizing a Muslim mind, the way I perceive the title to be, is that we have ideas in our head that are dictating how we see the world, then dictating how we behave in the world. That's the idea of a colonized mind. Meaning that an idea that is not yours is not indigenous to you, not indigenous to Islam, contradictory to Islam, has affected, entered our minds and is now controlling the CPU, the brain, of the Muslim. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that's how I understand the meaning of colonizing the Muslim mind. Namely that uh, these ideas have entered our brain, have entered our mind, and they're contradictory to our origin, which is Islam. So the premise here is that we understand Islam is our origin. The Quran and the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. This is who we are. That's the premise. You can't decolonize the Muslim mind without first affirming that we have a Muslim mindset. So these things, these sources, Quran, Hadith, the general understanding of what Islam is, over the millennium and a half, that's the default of this talk and this evening. So ideas outside of that have come in, grasped our mind without us realizing so the colonization, physical colonization, you all realize it, right? Mongols came in, the Crusaders came in, in Spain it was the Reconquista, and that's the nature of life. Everyone is out for everyone else's heart. That's the nature of existence. We're no different, except that prophets are coming saying, we have the truth. I don't want anything from your pockets. I want to give you guidance. That's what the prophets are saying. But everyone else is trying to influence and take a bigger piece of the pie. So the mind is the one thing that Western colonialists actually attacked. And that's why their colonization lasted and had a greater impact and a more dangerous impact than all previous enemies that Muslims have ever had in the Ummah. The Mongols came in for, their, for, for your body, for your wealth, for your cities. And they didn't have anything to offer intellectually. In fact, when they came into Islam, they became Muslims. When they came into the Muslim world, they became Muslims. We took their minds, and not we took their minds, being Islam convinced them. They became convinced, and they became Muslim. The Crusaders also came in, but they never successfully entered the mind of a Muslim. So that's the understanding and the, the premise of the conception of co the colonized mind. Now with what is the mind colonized? In every facet of life, the modern world has produced and codified an ideology from the origins of creation, the ontology, the nature of the universe through materialism, the origin of man through evolution, the econom economics, be it capitalism or communism, and capitalism, of course, won out, uh, concepts of justice. They trace back, essentially, to Marx, uh, his, his framework and his concern for justice outweighs every one, any other paradigm of justice. Why every justice seeker in Western secular world always went back. His, his snad goes back to Marx. 
He may change the nature of what he's talking about, but it's the same concept. All right? Gender and sexuality, the family unit. Uh, at every sphere of life, an idea has been brought forth. Now, before we get into this, instead of going through a list of ideas, the smarter way to do something is to look at what is the actual truth. Once a person knows the truth of things, then anything that contradicts that is one of these darknesses. Anything that contradicts that, that enters into our thinking pattern, okay, is a marker of a colonized Muslim mind. So Quran always brings and speaks about a dhulumat wa nur. The dhulumat are always plural, and the nur is always singular. Right? So the nur is one. It's as if you have one object, one tree. If you sh uh, shine a light on it, you'll see the tree. You'll see one tree, but you'll see a plethora of shadows. The tree is always one, but the shadows are always moving. They're always changing. And this is why knowledge of shadows is not always beneficial, because they're always changing. Whatever we're talking about, whatever ism we're talking about today, and oh, this is against Islam and it's colonized our mind. In 20 years, shaitan gets rid of that, brings you a new one. Every single ism is just a stepping stone for Iblis to get to the next one. And that's why these things are always coming, they're going away. I was at Hajj and thought to myself, here we are in Hajj. It felt like a war zone in Mina because they have cops moving, sirens nonstop. I'm like, this doesn't feel like a spiritual environment. This feels like a war zone. So it got my mind thinking, what was Hajj like in World War I? Like in the middle of World War I, right? people had to travel through the war. World War II, then the Afghan war, the communist times when the Russians... It got me thinking, and one of the th things that that thought pattern got through is that Hajj stayed the same. It never changed. What they were doing during World War I, during the Crusades, during the Mongol invasions, during the, uh, the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, what we're doing today is the same thing. But the Lulumats are always changing. The darknesses and the enemies, whether they be physical or intellectual, are always changing. So the best way to conceptualize, well, what is the truth, is to look at it, which I would conceptualize it as three Roman numerals. The first one is cosmology. What we, understand, what we believe exists. And you can never part from that. Once you agree to part from what you know exists and enter into someone else's playground where that thing does not exist, you're going to lose. The second one is epistemology, which is what are our sources of truth. Once we leave that and we agree to determine right and wrong from outside of our epistemology. Epistemology, what is a source of certainty? You're going to lose and you're going to end up with something different. So you have to be very careful which playground you ever enter, what sandbox you ever enter. The third one is then methodology, and that's inside. Well, once we're in Islam, what is the right method to understand what Islam is? Or is it just a nice pluralistic thing, whatever you call your Islam to be, whatever you identify it is, or is there some logic to it? Right? So the first thing on cosmology is given to us in Surah Al-Baqarah, right off the bat, first verse, like we have an introduction to a book, the author tells you why he wrote the book. That's the purpose of an intro, right? Allah says, Alif Lam Mim, Dhalika Al-Kitab La Rayba Fi. First thing he's telling you, this book is truth, it's not allegories, it's not estimations, it's absolute truth. It's actually epistemology. Hudan Lil Muttaqeen, it's only a guide for people who want to be guided. Right? Certain things only work if you want it to work. Miracles, the mu'ajizat of prophets, never converted a kafir to a moment. It only pulled out the iman that you had already in your heart or the kufr you had. Isra' al Maharaj just passed by. A lot of programs had Isra' al Maharaj programs. It didn't change anybody. At all Mecca, when the Prophet described everything to prove and he said, this caravan is on the way, they're about two weeks out. When they come, ask them that they had a camel with a black sack on one side and a white sack on the other side, and the camel tripped up and they lost all that product. That's an extremely detailed description, the Prophet said. He said, then there's another tribe, they're going to come in this many weeks, and they were looking for one of their camels. I saw that it had went astray, and they couldn't find it. Extremely detailed. Now all this... Stuff was confirmed, not a single person entered Islam. 
when the people of Saleh said, there's a, there is, they lived in the mountains. They said, bring us a nine-month-old camel, uh, a, a, a nine-month pregnant camel out of the rock. They're all gathered there. The rock breaks open and a pregnant camel comes out. Did anyone believe? No, no one believed. So Allah says, Hudan lil muttaqeen. You, if you want to be guided by this book, you'll be guided. But the first description of the muttaqeen, of the people who benefit, and is is part, if we're going to talk about a Muslim identity, our identity is not just what you're born with. This is the least important thing. It's what you choose. That's more important. Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. That is the first part of our belief, is that we believe in the unseen in general. Directly in the face of materialism. This is the book that is not for materialists. If you're a materialist, this book is not for you. Or you change yourself. So belief in Allah and the ghayb is the first part of our cosmology and ontology is that there is ghayb. There is ghayb. Well, now we have to ask, well, if there's ghayb, there's a lot of people who believe in ghayb who are quacks. Right? Uh, astrologers, palm readers. Have you ever seen a rich palm reader? They're all poor, right? They're all little shacks, right? Palm reading, and they're little shacks, and it's a poor person, right? So this stuff doesn't work. Or else you'd make a lot of money if it was real, right? So ghaib, the ghaib is something that we can only accept through transmission. Because once we say we believe in the unseen, that doesn't mean any claim to the unseen we accept. But this is the first most important thing. The claim we're going to talk, discuss second. When we discuss that Allah created the intellect, right, which is going to be our measure of what we accept of ghayb. We don't accept anything that just because we believe in the unseen, we're going to go and accept any old unseen, any claim. But this is the first thing, and it is a direct negation of every materialist philosophy and every materialist think, thought pattern. And it's amazing to me that people don't believe in the mu'ajizat of prophets and the karamat of awliya. How could you, why would you not believe in it? If Allah created this entire world, you don't think that he could create a small seed and put it in the Virgin Mary's stomach, in her womb? Like, What's bigger, a seed or this world? So these naturalistic laws and scientism is the belief that there is nothing beyond the cause and effect universe that we live in. This is a huge part of the colonized mind, and Europe brought that colonization in when they came with amazing science. They had amazing discoveries in science because they were able to manipulate what we call the hukum adi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the customs. We don't call these laws of nature. These are the customs of nature. And what's the difference between a law and a custom? Scientism and naturalism holds that these laws of cause and effect are permanent structures of the universe, unchangeable, absolute structures of the universe. We say, no, they're not. There's no proof for that either. Just because they that's all you see does not mean it's a law. Okay? We call it customs of nature. Okay? Because a custom is just something that we're used to. And when there's a cause and effect, they are two separate creations of Allah. We do not believe fire has any power in itself. Nor do we believe Allah gave it power. We believe that fire is a creation. Ashes is a separate creation. But out of Allah's mercy, when it, before He creates ashes, He creates fire. So that you know, avoid the fire, then you'll avoid the ashes. Before the creation of being burned, that's a creation. It's a separate creation, completely. He creates fire. So human being, if you don't want to get burned, avoid the fire, you won't get burned. But Allah tells us, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, went into a fire and felt coolness. If Allah wanted, this is aqidah. This aqidah sets you free. It sets you free of the limitations of scientism and naturalism, which is a massive vice grip on so many people's brains. And it's a source of great anxiety and depression. Because once you limit all possibilities to the material, your life is going to be miserable. That's why Allah is setting you free with ghayb. The world of cause and effect is a wonderful world to study, to know that Allah created the universe with precision. He, it's a mercy for us. If I want to know how to succeed, there are ways to succeed. If I want to know how to make green, it's always going to be blue and yellow. It's not one day going to be red and yellow. 
So it's predictable. The way the sun revolves around the earth in our perception or the earth revolves around the sun, right? We can count it to the millisecond to the point that we've actually counted that we're going faster. Or is it slower? I can't remember. But we are like milliseconds off. We can count that. That tells us Allah created this world with precision. So the study of cause and effect is a, is a wonderful blessing for us. And we can manipulate it and we could advance in our lives. But the moment we hit a brick wall, we never believed in you in the first place. We never believed in cause and effect in the first place. So materialism is the very first bedrock of all colonizations of our mind. And the worst of innovations in the Islamic world, if you look at the origins of how they view the world, they're all materialists. All right. I don't know if you've ever studied Ibn Sina, but I had a reason to, to, to examine his thought and his works. Everyone praises him for his medicine. The man was 1,000% a pure materialist. He did not believe in anything beyond the ghaib. Right? And just because those people put all their eggs in cause and effect, the illusion is that they're really smart. Because they put all their eggs in cause and effect, they're great scientists. They make amazing strides in science. But you hit a wall when it comes to everything beyond science. And human being is much more than just chemical interactions. And that's why these societies, when you go this path, Ibn Sina himself went into Great Depression, sex addiction, and he was an alcoholic. He was unmarried man living with his roommate. You fig you're living with one of his students. You tell me what's going on. The man was obese. He had an eating problem. He had addictions. He had every single non-physical, spiritually based ailment okay, that his own student wrote down. His own student, Al-Jurjani, wrote down that our Ustad has diagnosed himself. The cause of his sickness is excess food, excess alcohol, excess, excess sex. Okay. He had excess in everything. Why? Why do anyone have an excess in anything? Depression. The materialist, they hit a wall. So he's a great scientist. He's a great doctor. But he hits a wall. He can't treat something deeper inside. This is the first thing and the first vice that we have to, that vice grip that we have to cast off our minds is materialism. Secondly, a human being is different from anything else as because we have curiosity. And we need to feel that we belong. We need to feel that we have an origin. This is why there's no other creature besides a human being that is always obsessed about our origins. Where do we come from? If you take a single person who's adopted, his mind will spend their entire, their entire life wondering, where's my mom and dad? Why did they give me up? Or did they die? Are they martyrs? They die noble deaths where they killed. Why, why, where am I? Who am I? You look at a guy like Steve Jobs, if you ever read his biography, right? The man, his half of his life, half of his waking time was spent agonizing why his dad gave him up and why his mother gave him up. He'll tell you, no, no, I don't care. I don't care. Then why are you having these fits? He has fits, fits of rage, right? And then he goes and he does it to the next generation, abandoning his own daughter but then naming a computer after her, right? They said in his biography, if you sat with him, he'd, he'd give a psychiatrist whiplash from how much he negates that he cares, and then he shows he cares so much. Okay. So people need their origins. And now, this life, what prophets tell us is that we tell us our origin, tell us our destination, and tell us how to live in between. This is what couches the comfort of our hearts. Our hearts find comfort knowing, I know my origin, I know my destination, and I know what's happening in between. Try to watch a movie that's in an airport, and you have no clue what is going on. Where are you going? Where did you start from? Where did this movie start from? It starts right in the middle. And where is it going? No one will accept a life where we have no clue where we start, what's the starting point, what's the end point, right? And this is why the very first thing that Allah tells us in the Qur'an, after introducing the book, intro, what is the basis of this book? What's the first story in the Qur'an? Adam alayhi salam. It's not Musa, it's not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's actually one of the Orientalists was fair. And he said, there's a lot of things in the Qur'an that shows Muhammad didn't write this book. Right? And one of them is that he doesn't even appear in the book. Like he, he hardly appears as his story. Sirah is, is hardly in the book. 
It's all other prophets that are in the book. He didn't write about himself. When he talks about women, he doesn't write about his wife. He writes about other women. And his wife accepted that. That means she knows he's not the author. Okay? You would accept. You go write a woman a, a book about someone that's other than your wife. Right? Write a novel based upon your neighbor. Right? One of those where it's obvious it's based upon somebody else. See if the women in your life are going to take issue with that. Right? The prophet himself, his own name only appears four times. Moses appears 36 times. So the first story that Allah tells us is our origin. And this is why there is plenty. The secular world is obsessed with telling you that your origin is what your origin is and what it isn't. Why is the secular world so interested in this origins question? Where did we come from? Right? And Allah is telling you, you did not come from randomness. You came from an intentional creation that was created noble. Adam a.s. is created as a full created adult who speaks, who has manners, who has an intellect, and who's dressed. The Quran tells us this. Because when he ate from the forbidden tree, what did Allah say? فَبَدَتْ لَهُمَا سَوَاتُهُمَا فَالطَّفِقَ يَقْسِفَانِ عَلَيْهِمَا مِنْ وَرَقِ الْجَنَّةِ One of the signs that they had went astray, or made a mistake, or went off the path of Allah, they ate from that tree, their garment fell off. And they felt embarrassed by it, so they took leaves of the tree to cover themselves. Okay. So they were, we were created in nobility. And you go and look at somebody, you tell him, your father, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to demean any job. But hypothetically, your father was homeless, let's say. And your mother, she just worked at a bar. And they just had an accident, and you came out as an accident. Right? It was just a one-time thing. And you came out as an accident. What is the psyche of that kid going to be like? Because the individual, it's a microcosm. Then tell somebody, look, you're actually, your ancestors are princes and princesses okay, who came together in marriage and then you're the fruit of that family. person's going to hold his head up a lot differently than if you were an accident by lowly people. Okay? Or people whose behavior, we can say, is lowly. No human being is lowly. It's their behavior is lowly and renders you to be lowly. As Allah says, we've elevated you and then lowered you, meaning that is the best of creation. But then your behavior lowers yourself. So that we have to know that we have an origin that is not random. Randomness does not belong in the human existence at all. Everything is intentional. And this is why everything that is random, the Sharia eliminates it as a superstition or prohibition. Gambling is randomness. Uh, any buying and selling in which we don't know what we're going to get or give. Randomness is always out. Uh, meaning like trying to know your future by stars or cards all of this stuff is forbidden for us right? and it's untrue it's superstition it's randomness Allah wants to elevate willfulness the human willpower Islam is a religion that elevates intellect and willpower more than anything else even qada and qadar should never determine your behavior in the future qada and qadar predestination is only to alleviate and salvage your feelings about bad things that happened in the past. Qada and Qadr is for the past, not for the future. So much so, if an angel came and told you, I read your book of destiny and it says XYZ is going to happen to you today. What did the Prophet say? Ad-du'a yurudu al-qada. Du'a can alter this. That means if an angel itself came to you and told you, this is your future tomorrow. <coughs> Forget him. With du'a, you can alter this. So what is Allah doing? He elevates willpower in this religion. Now let me contrast that with another religion. Christianity is a religion that you're born in original sin. Why? Because Adam ate from the tree. But you're saved. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. Well, what did I do in between? <laughs> right? I'm guilty for something Adam did. Then I'm saved for something Jesus did. So what's the problem? Where is my willpower here? So the, the creation of the human being, the origin of the human being is extremely important to, with rusukh, to place in the hearts and in the minds of everyone born that you are created with will and with nobility. And this life is a mission. It's not a random location. It's not a random thing. Janna fil ardi khalifa. So the purpose of the human being is khalifa on the earth. We represent the creator. 
in this earth? In what way do we represent the Creator? In conflict. There's going to be conflicts in this earth. We're put in a place of conflict. This, it's an octagon. This world that we're in is a place of conflict. Okay? And it's a conflict to see who's going to represent properly. Conflict with our nefs. Conflict with other humans. Conflict with jinn. Conflict with disbelievers. It's a place of conflict. Okay? And you represent the Creator in this conflict. So you have an amazing job and an amazing function. We're not even here as a punishment. We're here by design. That Allah says we have placed in the earth a khalifa. He was only created in the heavens, but this is his, the arena of his struggle, and he's created for this. So origin, to me, is extremely important. And once someone deviates to that and allows himself to believe in the random development of the human being from a lowly creature, in evolution you can believe that frogs evolved, horses, dogs whales believe all that all you want <coughs> but you're not allowed to believe that for the human being it's doctrine okay next is that what is the nature of this human being the nature of the human beings were composed of intellect soul and and in a body the body is the least important but without it we can't survive in this world the intellect say nadi said is the most noble of allah's creation and in the same way that grammar rectifies speech, the study of logic rectifies the use of the intellect. Okay? If, you don't, if you take commas out, and there are all sorts of sentences where you take the comma out or put it after the other word, it has a bad meaning. You put it in front of the, another word, it has an innocent meaning. Grammar, without grammar, we can't communicate properly. We can't write. We can't read. We won't understand what you're saying without grammar. Well, likewise, the human being is created with an intellect by which we can maneuver throughout this world. And there's a war on intellect. The war today on intellect is that feelings override intellect. Facts are not determined by feelings. And that's where we're headed in the world today. Is, is there a name for this kind of assault or this, this philosophy? Who, know, who knows if there's a name, but we definitely know it exists. Okay. We definitely know it exists. Right and wrong, true and false, Allah gave us an intellect so that we could all agree on it. And the intellect has never changed. The intellect of Adam, our intellect, the intellect of Moses, the laws of intellect never change. You could write them down, and what was written down the first time, you only have a few additions, okay? There, or, or rewordings, really. The laws of intellect never change. There will never be a new discovery of a, a law of logic. Right? Physical things of the world will never stop being discovered. So there's always scientific discoveries. But logic, the way human beings think, okay, that render certain things necessary, certain things impossible, and certain things possible, the law of non-contradiction, the necessity of defining terms when we use them, these very fundamental basics of logic will never change. The last human being that was ever exist and say to Adam, their brains are the same. Not the same in what they uh, know, but how they work. Okay. You, if you tell somebody that someone is dead, and then you tell them later on that you saw them walking across the street, it's a contradiction. right? It's got to be one or the other. Very basic things will never change. And there's a, now, we're now facing a time where uh, facts are no longer determined by observation and intellect. Facts are determined by hawa, whim. It's a fact because I want it to be a fact. Because if it's not a fact, I'm going to commit suicide. This is the world that we're living in now. Right? How do I know that's a darkness? Well, Allah created the intellect and elevated and said, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Over nearly a dozen times in the Qur'an. Do you not use your intellects? And what is all sharia not obligatory upon? The person who has no intellect. Either his intellect hasn't grown yet, so he's not in bulugh, he hasn't reached bulugh, or the person who's insane, or the person who's fainted or unconscious this these three categories of people they're not they can do whatever they want they're not taken into account so intellect to us is extremely important it's an extremely important part of our curriculum and it's extremely important of uh, 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 mechanism to know what is true and what is false we talked about the ghaib which what ghaib do we believe in what unseen do we believe in only that which passes rigorous transmission 
with a chain back to Allah and His Messenger. If God and His Prophet said it's real, of the unseen, then it's, that's what's going to be real. Any hadith? No, not any old hadith. Hadith is not the word of the Prophet. It is claims about the words of the Prophet. It's a claim that the Prophet said this. So there are hadith that are fabricated hadiths. Okay. Our ulama from the get-go deciphered and, 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 and put through a sieve all claims about the Prophet and separated out what is a fabrication, what is weak, and what is reliable. And that's the unseen we accept. We also accept another kind of unseen, which is that which you can demonstrate its existence. Microwaves, we can demonstrate its existence. So it's either going to come from transmission or demonstration. The sign that people are losing their way as civilization is that they no longer appreciate the intellect as a source of sep fact, separating what's true and what's false, and they no longer, uh, they, they willingly accept something simply because they want it to be true. And we've seen that in the political discourse and in the cultural discourse over the past decade, more than any other time probably in American history. People just believe something because they want to believe it. They come to the conclusion, then they sew up the evidence afterwards. We're the opposite. We say, what's the, what's the tools and what's the method? Of Then input all the fa information, and then we come out with the conclusion. So intellect to us is something that we have to revive and realize we're losing. All right? And we're in a culture now where facts and intellect did not matter. The only thing that matters is the brute force of your desire. Next is the creation of Hawa. And it's important as the ulama of Qur'an and the ulama of tafsir say, you don't always look at what Allah did or said. You also need to look at what Allah didn't say or didn't do. And Allah Ta'ala never needs to give us metaphors in the creation. He just creates. His creation is His story. Whereas we need to tell stories because we can't create something. I have to give, I have to give you a story with the meaning inside of it. But Allah creates it. And it's extremely telling how Allah Ta'ala, what Allah created second. He did not create a Sahabi for Sayyidina Adam. He did not create a, a daughter for Sayyidina Adam. He did not create a, 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 a son. He could have created anything. But he created a wife. The first creation is the wife. And that tells you what is important to the human being. And what makes a human being whole. The Prophet said, as a tafsir of the creation of Hawa, as the first creation after Adam. Now, another thing about what we said about the cause and effect Allah created Adam in one way, He created Hawa in a total different way. Okay? He created Isa in a whole other way. And then He created all of us in a fourth way. So Allah can create, created the human being in four different ways. Yeah. Again, showing us he's not bound by any cause. And he's the maker of these customs of nature. They're not laws. They're customs of nature. Yeah. And he could alter them whenever he wishes. But creating Hawa is the complete, the human being is now a complete unit. He is not a complete unit by himself. Individualism that's spreading. You think it's going to make you happy. It doesn't make you happy. You need to have a pair. You are incomplete without a pair. Now, look at also what happened with Sayyidina Adam. <coughs> Sayyidina Adam was, a, he spoke to Allah first, and Allah saw that he had adab. The first thing that Adam did, he looked up and he saw a grape. As soon as the soul went into his nose, he sneezed. He said, Alhamdulillah. Allah says, it's your sunnah that you've established. I'll make it a sunnah for everyone after you. He was pleased with Adam's intuitive reaction to sneezing. He then the, when the soul went into his stomach He was hungry He felt it's empty My stomach's empty So he reached up to grapes that were hanging But his legs weren't formed yet The soul had not entered They were formed But the soul hadn't entered his legs so Like they were dead They were not alive So he fell And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولَ He said the human being is rushing He wants something faster than its time And this is going to be the Example of all your children. They'll be rushing. You're the microcosm of their nature. Then when he did finally reach and he ate from the grape, he said, Bismillah. And he said, and Allah said, May Allah bless you. May you be blessed. And this is a sunnah now for your creation to say Bismillah before they eat. 
and he ate with his right hand. So he is a human being created with adab, with manners, with knowledge. Yeah. So he was given the garden. He said, Tra travel wherever you wish in this garden is all yours, except one tree. Don't eat from it. We don't know what a tree is. For some reason it came in Christian culture that it's an apple tree. But we don't have that. Uh, we really don't have any claim on what tree it is. Some people say it was a hinta or wheat, which is, I don't understand because you don't eat that raw, right? So who knows? But it, we don't say it was an apple tree. And that's irrelevant. Don't eat from this tree. Adam alayhi salam was first educated by Allah on the names of things, the vocabulary. Then he gave a speech to the malaika. That's the first Jummah khutbah. Then Adam alayhi salam traveled through paradise from Dhuhr to around Asr. He got bored. And he found an area, a soft area of land, and he took a nap. He fell asleep. He dozed off. Human being, if he had paradise in front of him, without a mate, be bored. Now, Allah Ta'ala saw that this per Adam is unsatisfied. He's not happy. Despite all of paradise. So Allah then created from him his wife, Hawa. Okay. When he had Hawa, he was so engaged with Hawa, he forgot the prohibition. He had one prohibition, one rule to follow. He forgot the rule. That's how engaged he was. Okay. And they have different stories. Iblis came in the form of an animal. He came in an animal and he tricked him. And, or he totally forgot. Okay. Or he forgot to tell Hawa that it's haram. He was so engaged with her that he forgot the rule. But what does that tell you about the human being? They have to be together. And they're, the colonized mind of some people today is individualism and careerism. That you're actually better off on your own, saving your money, doing what you want, flying from place to place, and living this individual life. You're not going to be satisfied. Allah and His Prophet know best for us. Allah knows best. What makes him being happy? And every destruction of the family unit is a destruction of the human being. Look at what Allah, how Allah describes the story of the human being in the Quran. It's a story of families. Ali Imran, the story of Nuh and his wife, Lut and his wife. That's like a, a cautionary tale. Fir'aun and Asiya, another broken house. He's given you examples. Al al Bayt, Al Yasin. Al Yasin is also most likely in the tafsir. It's not the family of Yasin, it's Il Yasin, which is Prophet Ilyas. That's more fitting in the siyak of the ayah. But this is the story of families. The family unit, the attacks upon it, if we accept these habits, these cultures of life, we're infecting ourselves with a disease that's going to destroy us. Okay. So by knowing the, the, the tree, you can tell the shadows. The shadows are always opposites of the tree. And this is why some of the best, some of the worst, Iblis, alayhi lanatullah, he is the enemy of truth. Yet why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever allow him to live in Jannah? You ever think about this? If he's adu Allah, but he was in paradise, living in the heavens. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to furnish him, or Allah ta'ala chose to furnish him with knowledge of the right path so that he could cook up the opposite path. If he didn't know the path of righteousness and goodness, he wouldn't know how to furnish a dark side. The dark side is always exact opposite of the truth. And all we have to do is know the truth. Then when you see something, you assess it against the truth and you know it's the opposite. So the first creation and the family unit is how humanity moves on. Once you break down this family unit, you, and family units could be different. Different cultures have different ways of doing it. Nonetheless, it's a marriage. Marriage is only necessary when people produce a child, right? In the sense that the existence of marriage is to assign who's responsible for this baby. So my friends don't need to get married, right? There's no responsibility between us. As soon as we do business together, now we have to have a contract because there could be problems now. Well, who's responsible for the business? Who gets the money? Likewise, because a man and woman can produce a child, anytime a man and woman come together, it has to be an open public marriage. So we all know 
that whatever comes out of whatever baby comes out of this mar- uh, out of this mar- this household, whose responsibility is it to take care of it? Okay. So the attacks on marriage come not just they're never just direct, but they're coming through gender wars that are more some of the more contemporary indoctrinations or diseases of the mind. All right, a Muslim has can never choose a side on these gender wars. And if you want to know how to deal with women, I can tell anybody real quick how to deal with women. Because us as Muslims, we don't deal with women. Let's say as a man, I deal with five women. As long as I know how to deal with these five women in my life, I'm good. Right? I don't need to deal with women. What women? I deal with my mom, my sister, my niece, my wife, my daughter, my mother-in-law. It's six women. (laughs) If I treat six women and I'm good with six women, I'm good with women. What do I need to know anything else about the other woman for? Allah makes it easy, right? So I'm, I never get into a discourse on men. Women, I get in discourse on these six people. Not even the categories, just these people. I say, what has Allah commanded me? What's my responsibility to these six individuals? My duty to my mom, my duty to my wife, my duty to my sister, my duty to my niece, my duty to my daughter, my duty to my mother-in-law. What, what else do I need? Everyone else falls in another category. My neighbor, she call, she's in the category of neighbor. Employee, she's in the category of my employee. Not a woman. Employee. Yeah. Boss, she's in the category of employer. Investor, she's in the category of investor. She's not a category of woman. Okay? Random people on the street, strangers. That's it. Mm-hmm. Allah made this so easy for us. There's no confusion on this. Right? So this gender, this is the more recent one. But when we look at how Allah Ta'ala's the initial creation and this relationship, we realize how important the family unit is. Now let's move on to epistemology. Epistemology, now that we know what exists, this is the structure of existence. Now what's our religion? And our religion is the book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then our next source of knowledge is our intellect. The next source of knowledge is demonstrable, scientific, things that I can demonstrate in front of me. Okay. And then after that, it's customs. All right. Customs, whatever, we, orf, what we agree on is generally good. All right. Customs of a society only rise to the top because we all agree that, whether formally or informally, that this is good for us. Right. Like traffic laws is generally good for us to follow. There's no, it's not rooted in reason, it's not rooted in demonstration, demonstrable knowledge, observable knowledge, it's not rooted in transmitted knowledge, it's wadai, we all agree upon it. But most importantly for us is to talk about the epistemology of a Muslim is the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a Muslim should never part from this. Okay. There is no Islam without the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a disease that affected Muslims about a hundred years ago, starting with the Orientalists such as Joseph Schacht, the British and German and French Orientalists, later American Orientalists. And the first place that this uh, came about in the Muslim world or was accepted in the Muslim world was in India, where the British people were educated, the British colonizers were educating Muslims and had gotten to one or two intellectuals of the Muslims that you cannot trust your hadith. And let me give you in a nutshell that the Western civilization woke up to critical thinking about history in the Renaissance, which we all studied in like fourth grade. What happened in the Renaissance? They began to be in love with languages. When they began to be in love with languages and studying all these uh, languages and ancient Greek texts, etc., they realized the Catholic Church is pulling off a massive scam. A massive scam. And just to give you two of the most important documents, just two of many, that they discovered were lies to them, direct lies, was that the Trinity verse was put, was not found in the Greek Bible and one of the other translations, it was not found there. The Trinity only comes in one verse. Imagine Tawheed, that Allah is one, only comes in one verse of the Quran. Like this is your number one doctrine, right? Shouldn't it be on like every other page? <clears throat> SubhanAllah. But the Trinity verse was a scam. They put it in there. 
Because when they went back to previous books, they found it's not there. Our forefathers lied to us. They scammed us. What else? Just as an example, the Vatican itself was supposedly given as a gift from Constantine to the Pope to, to, to run Christianity out of this area of land and it's free for you. Okay? The, the, the document is a scam. The document is a lie because they saw words were used at that time. Words were in the document that were not used at that time. That's just two examples of many. There's a guy named Erasmus. He's famously known as a font in, in Microsoft. Okay? <laughs> but this guy admits, he said, he was a secular guy, but he was good at languages. He said, the Christians came to me and said, we need you to translate this book, translate this Bible from the Greek to the Latin. But right here, we need you to throw in this verse. He's like, I don't think that's right. <laughs> the guy's a Catholic, right? And he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to mess up the Bible. This stuff is all documented. So the, the, the critical thinking of, of the West begins, is born in distrust of religion. That's when they said, hold on, we got to redo the whole history. And many people have taken that attitude of distrust. It's a doctrine and a method, and a method of suspicion. To be suspicious of any powerful force of the past. An institution of the past. Went and took this to Hadith. Well, let's go to our indigenous historical criticism. Where does the critical thinking about history begin in the world of Islam? It begins with Hadith. It begins with the Sahaba. And the Quran itself says, if a fasiq means an outsider, comes to you, جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَابَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُ If fasiq here doesn't mean a sinner, it means an outsider. Comes to you with news. Someone comes outside and says, hey, the elevator's not working. <laughs> we got to know, what, is he trustworthy or not? Tabayyanu. Don't just say it and believe it. Don't blindly follow. Surah Al-Hujurat. Do not blindly follow. The Sahaba themselves, Abu Huraira, people don't know this, was a young man. He lived three years with the Prophet. His, his specialty was to write down everything the Prophet said. When the Prophet returned to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would go to all the Sahaba say, all right, sit down, tell me everything you know, and write down their hadith. That's how he has so many hadith. He took it directly from the Sahaba. He just doesn't always cite them. Okay? Abu Huraira got really good at this. And in the middle of the Khilaf of Omar, he's like, he's like 10 years in now, documenting hadith. He sits down, he starts giving halakas in the mosque. Qala sa Rasulullah, qala Rasulullah. Now Omar walks in, and he's... He wants to be cautious. Omar would not accept the hadith unless he heard it from a second companion. He sat and very quickly, you're, you're too young to be claiming to be expert in hadith. Okay, where, where are you getting this from? Leave the mosque. Don't ever speak about hadith again. Omar kicked him out. He kicked him out to teach him, be extremely careful when you transmit a hadith of the Prophet. Double check and triple check that it's correct. Sayyidina Umar expelled Abu Huraira for teaching hadith. Of course, he let him back in. And he used him as a governor. He was just teaching him a lesson. Big Sahaba, like Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Umar asked the question, has anyone heard from the Prophet this? Anything about this matter? Abdul Rahman ibn Auf came and he said, I heard this. Has anyone else heard it so that we can be fully sure that this is from... How Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is guaranteed paradise. He's still a human being. He can make a mistake. I want to hear from somebody else. So from the time of the companions, critical thinking about transmissions began. Then it continued and continued and continued until we have a corpus of literature that would d triple this room just on transmitters, not the hadith, just the transmitters. And they, they would study transmitters to such a degree that he so-and-so sat with so-and-so in this country at this time and in this mosque. This stuff is written in the books that I have taken the first quarter of Sunan Abi Dawood from Abu Dawood himself, from this hadith to this hadith, in this mosque on this day of this many days past from the month of Shaban. Okay. And he'll stop there. He's just telling you, I only took a quarter of the book. Then he had to leave, I had to leave. We have all, such detailed documentation so that when someone comes up and says, well, the historical critical method 
informs us this. We say we have our own historical critical method. It's called al-jarh with ta'deel. Okay? And it's far superior to yours. Mm -hmm. And it's far longer and it's been criticized by more people than yours has. Okay? So, to develop trust in hadith, we know that distrust in hadith is a poison that has been placed in our minds because a certain civilization, the Western civilization, took their understanding of authority and placed it upon us. That means you got abused by your dad, a woman gets abused by her dad every time she sees a daughter and a dad, right? And he sees the dad telling the girl what to do, that's abuse. Just because you're abused doesn't mean everyone else is abused, right? You were abused as a child. Don't now go and look at every parent-child relationship and see abuse. That's exactly what they did. It's called projection. Civilizational projection. And the last thing that we have to talk about, within Islam, we don't have a free-for-all. Our religion is guarded by language and reason. The Quran and Hadith inform us what Islam is and what is the correct understanding of every issue based upon the nature of the language of the verses. Contrasted with the, the meanings of these words in pre-Islamic poetry. Pre-Islamic poetry is the default. That's, what, that's the referee of what a word means. You cannot know what a word means right, without a reference point. And the reference point is before this document came, before the Scrabble match begins, what dictionary are we going with? Webster's, Merriam, dictionary.com, before the game begins, so that no one finds a good word that's in one dictionary and not another, and says, no, no, I want to use that dictionary, because it supports my conclusion. No. So pre-Islamic poetry was hung from the Kaaba. It was well known. It's all over the place. Okay, That's what tells us what a word means in the Quran. Okay? So we know what the words mean. And then some words are equivocal. That means they could mean many different things. There's a list of meanings. Some words are unequivocal. There's one meaning. Like, what's an example? Nor, uh, numbers. Numbers in Arabic have one meaning. So, thalatha, there's no other thing called the thalatha. Right? There's no other thing called the thalatha. There's only one thalatha, which is the number three. So certain things are unequivocal, and that's the basis of our language. If the unequivocal is repeated as the basis of our religion. If the unequivocal words and verses are repeated all over the Qur'an and the hadith, that is the definition of Islam. You can say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, all you want. Once you exit that, you've exited Islam. Right? And then you have the unequivocal verses and hadith. It can only have one meaning, according to the referee, which is the language. So we have to remove this from our egos. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with the language. It's unequivocal, but it's only mentioned once. Then that is the correct understanding. Okay. Then you have that's what we that's what orthodoxy is. Orthodoxy is composed <coughs> by the unequivocal verses and hadith that are mentioned one or more times. Okay. Islam itself is defined by the unequivocal that is repeated, and there's not that many. Right? The Kaaba is in Mecca. Hajj is Hajj is in Mecca. Ramadan is the month of fasting. The zakat is part of Islam. There are five daily prayers. These very basic things. Okay. Also known as known in religion by necessity. The, the third thing is that now we have equivocal verses, interpretive verses, verses that can be interpreted in different ways. We also split those in two. That is either, there is either a consensus on its meaning or there is no consensus on its meaning. If it's a consensus on its meaning, then we, that is also part of the definition of orthodoxy. However, to infringe upon that does not render the person an innovator. You're not altering the religion, you're just going against the consensus on a matter. If there is no consensus on an interpretive text of Quran and Hadith, that's where you have madhabs, because Allah did not speak in unequivocal language throughout the whole book. Part of the book is, uh, is equivocal, it means it could have multiple meanings. That's where we have methods. So this, the, the shadow of that, if this is part of the tree and part of what is true, the shadow of that is the deviations within Islam on doctrines and practices, and this is how we referee them. So that's the end of my presentation. We can now turn to any of your comments, questions, additions, subtractions, and anything else.
Yes. Um, okay, so this goes back to what you were talking about in the very beginning. Um, when we're discussing or we're trying to reconcile cause and effect with predestination and free will, um, what are your thoughts on how to connect the two? And, and so, like, what I mean by that is, like, you said that materialism um, is associated with cause and effect, and if we look outside of that um, in Islam, then we know that there's more than just cause mm-hmm. and effect, right? But free will and um, predestination at the same time teaches us that, like, if we do something, something else is going to happen to it. But then we also believe in the ghayb, and we believe that things are possible, like Ibrahim and Yassan, I'm going into the fire. Yeah. So how do you apply that realistically to, like, today? When we talk about free will and the disbelief in that we disbelieve in the necessity and the absolute necessity of cause and effect but we do believe in and we're commanded to behave by the known cause and effect such that if you know for sure that water quenches thirst then you're obligated uh, to use that to use that you can't now say well he was dying in front of me i had a jug of water i'm not guilty because we don't believe Right? It, it, no, we don't believe in the absoluteness of it, but we are bound to behave by it. We are not allowed to walk off and expect a miracle. We have to actually use the asbab. So, so we accept customs as laws until they're not? No, we live by them. Okay? We are commanded to live by them, but we do not believe they're absolute. That's the difference. They are there only because Allah chose them to be there. There could be a world and a universe where uh, yellow and green, or yellow and blue do not make green, right? It's possible. That water doesn't quench thirst. It's possible. But it's irrelevant to us. In this world that Allah created us, He created these two things together. We have to live by them physically. We just don't believe they're absolutes. Why? What's the value of that? The value of that is that the moment that you run out of causes, <clears throat> the moment that you run out, and you're in a complete jam, you still don't lose hope. That's the value. What is the value of this doctrine? Is that the moment we run out of all causes and effects, we don't lose hope. Okay? Because we believe Allah has something greater. Right? So, but insofar as we have, Allah says, أَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مَقُوَةً So that as long as you have these cause and effects at your disposal, you will not be given success unless you use them. Right? What was somebody since said here? That... Uh, was it there's no tawakkul without a plan? You're not allowed to rely upon Allah unless you take make a plan first. And you use every possible thing. Then you could say I rely on Allah. Even the Prophet said this about a man. He said, Hasbi Allah Nam shaking his head. He said, the Prophet said, What's the matter? He said, My neighbor bothers me. Hasbi Allah. He said, Did you do something about it? He said, No, I just rely on Allah. Hasbi Allah. He said, No, go and try to change the situation. Allah gave you hands, feet, move and change. When you run out, then say Hasbi Allah Nam so that's the relationship between our actions and our disbelief in the absoluteness of these cause and effect. Yes? Uh, uh, you started the lecture by saying that like, the Muslim mind has been colonized by the, you know, by the foreigners. So what would be your advice on decolonizing? Uh, reading the Quran and the Sunnah with contemplation it puts up the truth remember the truth is like a tree when the light shines on it you, you see this everything that is contrary to it is a darkness is a, is a vice grip and a poison in our brains so we just have to know what the truth is because guaranteed it's 2023 now February 2033 is going to be something different it's changing so quickly. February 2033, in 10 years, half of the stuff we're talking about is not going to be the issue. There's going to be new issues, totally new issues that our minds cannot fathom that are <coughs> darkness. And some Muslims, that, the Prophet Sallallahu said, if the Jews and Christians were to get into the habit of having intercourse with their own mothers, some people from my ummah will do the same. There are always weak-minded people of Muslims who follow. They'll follow anybody. Every type of secular idea out there, you will find a Muslim amongst them. It's the prophecy of the messenger. He said, if they were to go into a lizard hole, a tiny little hole in the ground, one of people from my Ummah will go in. Because there's weak-minded people. Okay? And people with inferiority complexes who are followers. And they will imitate. Oh, yeah. 
did that answer the question of free will? You can ask a follow-up if I, if I did not uh, perceive your question properly. No, free will in general, a uh, predestination in general, the function of it is to utilize it regarding the past, not regarding the present or the future. And we have enough free will, clearly, to be judged. Right? That's, that's how we understand it. We have enough to be judged. We're ca- accountable. Yes, Tom. How do you deal with like uh, people close to you that have that type of mindset? People what? People close to you that have like the colonized mindset. Uh, the question was, how do you deal with people who are close to you that have adopted one, some <coughs> concept, some idea that is clearly in contrast to Islam, either in our cosmology, our epistemology, or our methodology? Okay. That's how you have to break it in your head. Cosmology, epistemology, and methodology. Um, you're, if, if people are up to talking, you can talk. But most importantly, if you can't get to them because some people are set in their ways, then you have to inoculate everyone around them from their, from their problem. Right? You have to inoculate everyone around them. What is inoculate? Inoculate, you got to teach everyone around them so that they're not affected. If you can't change somebody, at least quarantine the situation. Right? If you have one of your kids, hypothetically, or someone in your family, I'd say doesn't believe in hadith. I'm sure everyone has someone, in the, hopefully not too close to you, that is one of these people. Right? Don't believe in hadith. I was invited one time to Indiana, and they said, be careful, it was this very small community. Be careful, there's an uncle, he's a very nice guy, but he doesn't believe in hadith. Every speaker we get, he tells him on hadith. Okay? So, of course, the Q&A comes. First question is from this guy uh, about hadith. Okay? So I said, look, I, I'll talk to you about hadith later. I told him, I'll answer you later. At some point in the next, in the Q&A, I got an opening to talk about Muhammad Iqbal, the poet Muhammad Iqbal. Now, this question was Pakistan. I said, oh, you all talk about Iqbal. I read his stuff. It's not even that good. Right? It's not that good. The poem's not that good, right? This guy went ballistic. It was experience that knows that people who hate Hadith, they still love Iqbal, right? He went ballistic. A chimney just blew up. And he said, did you read the Urdu? Right? I said, did you read the Arabic of Hadith? <laughs> I judged on the English. I judged Iqbal on the English. I never read the Urdu. He said, you have to judge it on the Urdu. I said, likewise for Hadith. Did you read the Arabic? Right? <laughs> the poor man, I had to apologize after. He was so embarrassed, right? I had to apologize to him afterwards. But that was the point was made, right? That's how you make the point. You got to show them, like, you wouldn't accept it for Iqbal to be judged on the English, not the Urdu. Yet you are capable of judging the messenger on Hadith in English not when you haven't even read the Arabic. Let alone the sourcing, the jarh and ta'adif. You cannot possibly pick up a book called Seer Alam and Nubala and still be convinced that a fraud was being played. Because Seer Alam and Nubala has got all the biographies of the noble scholars, like the, the, the notable scholars. They're from all over the world, right? They never met one another. Yet they're transmitting, end up transmitting the same hadith, right? Never met one another. There's no way they colluded. There's no way someone came up with this fanciful of a tale. And most of the tale, it's mundane, too. If you're an author of a tale and you're trying to pull the wool over people's eyes, mundane things are not the ingredient. But you find that in Hadith. So I would inoculate the people, and we have to be educated. And the war today, we're in war. All of us are in a war. Iman is a war today. We're in war. And the first step is to cement your Iman with with massive screws is cemented into the ground. You ever see these bridges, how big the screw is, or some of these towers? The screw is like this big. You have to cement your iman with knowledge, not just a transmitted from the family iman, or cultural iman, or just what the local masjid iman. None of that. You need to know for sure. And Allah has, as much as there's confusion, Allah created a cure. People always talk about how bad the internet I'll tell you how good it is There is a lot of truth on the internet It's accessible to our, at our own hands Next question 
Yes. Uh, how do we respond to the claim often raised by atheists and agnostics that religion in its form today like exists only really as a social like lubricant? It's not an aid to truth, and that um, you know, yeah, basically. That Firstly, way. if you're an atheist, there is no truth. <laughs> if you're a Darwinist, this is all an accident. <clears throat> And even the way your brain is formatted, it's just a format that uh, reflects, that has a desire for truth and falsehood, but the truth and falsehood is not truly true and false. It's just that you know, the chemicals of your brain have created a world where you imagine there's true and false. So within the question is, is, is a premise that's not even correct. Okay? If you are an atheist, there is no true and false. Okay? If you're a Darwinist. And I don't know if there's any other kind of atheist, right? <laughs> there's only one way to be an atheist, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. You will believe that we just came about. Okay. So then there is no true and false. So first the question is like, well, okay, fine. What's your problem with it? If I want to delude myself, let me delude myself. You get high, right? And enjoy being high. Enjoy being drunk. If I want to delude myself, let me delude myself. So that's one answer. All right, second answer is that if it was merely a social thing, there would be no individuals who are as a minority upon a religion. But we find many cases where individuals are against, go against their social construct, their social structure, to preserve their religion. Right, so if it's merely, if its only utility was social, social uh, cohesion, then how is it that there are so many people who are basically going against the grain of their society. One of the reasons, the wisdoms of the downfall of the Khilafah and the creation of a diaspora of Muslims is really to, to negate the concept that Islam was established by sultans and kings. And people were Muslim because the sultan made them Muslim. Or the sultan established, the sultan or the khalifas and the kings established a, uh, a national religion, right? Well, here we are, 100 years later, and Islam is growing without anything. Without, in fact, most Muslim countries are fighting it. Most Muslim countries, their rulers, they go, not only do they not sponsor a religion, they're fighting a religion. Right? And yet it's still spreading. So that sort of flies in the face of the thesis that it's the Islamic world was only the way it is because kings made it that way. Next. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about like seeking knowledge, right? Yeah. So how as like people who like let's say like many of us like are not really so keen on parsing what's good and what's not, like like good knowledge and bad knowledge, let's say like who's credible to go to? Or like what sources you get from let's say like reading let's say books that are not like because you know, if you look at a hadith or we look at a Quran first straight up you know, we don't understand the context, we don't know the, maybe like the circumstance that Hadith was transmitted, who transmitted it, and all that. Like, how do we actually navigate this, especially for, like, if we're just starting up, like, you know, like, all the All right, so the, if everyone heard the question, if you're just a beginner in Islam, and you feel like it's a maze to go through, right, the best way is not to have to go through it yourself, is to find guides to take you through it. And you may be ignorant in Islam, but that doesn't mean you're ignorant, period, right? I don't know anything about, let's say, uh, health. But if I wanted to, I could figure it out. And the way to figure it out is to find someone who knows, assess if I trust him. I can use my brain to see if I trust this person and to see if what he's saying makes sense to me, right? And if it's corroborated by others, and then you take guides. Then I assess that he is worthy of a guide. He's worthy to be a teacher. Okay. So that's how the common Muslim has to use his intellect. The common Muslim does not use his intellect to learn the conclusions. The common Muslim uses his intellect to choose the right teacher. And the way you do that is you have to ask yourself, is you do know something about Islam, does he reflect those akhlaq? Does he reflect that? Is he behaving according to that? Is he living according to that? Is he corroborated by other teachers? Right? If a guy pops up and says, I give out medical degrees, or I'm going to...
phone her out and say, hey, is his degree accepted in this academy, right? And they say yes, then I, I know I can trust him. So this is why it's so important that scholars invite scholars all the time. They appear on panels together. That's a type of corroboration. Mm-hmm. So uh, when, when we, uh, if I have an interview or if I invite someone to the masjid, I'm telling my community, this is a trustworthy person. You can take religion from this person. If I bring someone onto my uh, a live stream, for example, I could, that's basically a signal. He invites me on his live stream. He is signaling corroboration. So you get to see that a group of people are corroborating one another. So the way that you, as a com- you're a common Muslim, say, I don't know anything, I, I'm confused. You are smart enough to choose a teacher. One whose message settles in my heart. I benefit from it. He's corroborated by other speakers and other shiuk. His words, he cites himself. I can trust him. And it's the same way we learn our deen, by choosing a method. You don't go and choose a conclusion on traveler's prayer, a conclusion on fasting. I got to figure out how to do zakah. No, you choose a methodology. An imam and a madhab's methodology, that's what's more important. What is the Shafi methodology? What's the Hanafi methodology? You choose the methodology. Then you put all the inputs go in and the conclusions are out and the conclusions are already there. That's what makes sense. It doesn't make any sense to say, okay, I'm going to go to Islam and open the Quran and I'm going to actually go and find every possible conclusion. That doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is you go to the methodology first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Can we uh, support political parties here in the U.S. or is that like a trick of, uh, like a colonial trick on us? Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> let me tell you this. The one thing that doesn't make any sense is that Muslims gain a reputation for always supporting the same party. Because then you're taken <coughs> for granted by that party and the other party doesn't even talk to you because they know you've lost you. Right? So, whatever you want, we can talk a lot about should we support a candidate or not, but I'll tell you one thing I know for sure, it is the stupidest thing, to not even make them compete for you, for your vote. They're not even competing for our vote. They'll know, that the, 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 the Republicans know, all the Muslims are with the Democrats. Democrats don't need to just put a hijabi somewhere in the background. That's <laughs> they don't even ask us what we want, right? And we had a guy... We had one time Cory Booker came to the masjid and he spoke because he was the New Jersey senator at the time. And he and a guy goes at the end of the talk, "You have our vote." So man, he didn't even give us anything. So, oh. <laughs> so we're not savvy on this thing. We're not savvy. Oh, uh, the George Washington University was a very unique school because they had a contract with Saudi. Saudi Arabia used to send students there. Okay, so the George Washington University ended up very unique with 17% Muslim population. And they used it very well. They did not choose a party at all. Every time there was student president, they would simply have two meetings. They'd meet with one president, ask him, what are you going to give us? they go to the other president, what are you going to give us? Okay. Then they'd go together all right, to have a shoot a, a MSA meeting, and they say, guys, this is what they said. Whatever we decide, we're all going to vote in a block. And they always vote in a block. And they got a disproportionate amount of benefits. They had a wudu room, halal food, prayer room. They had a, disrep- Eid off. They had a disproportionate <coughs> amount of benefit because they used their block smartly. Mm-hmm. And that's what I would advocate Muslims to do. Mm-hmm. Right? Just use your block smartly, not the way that we're using it now, which is a guaranteed right, Democrat vote. Uh, what do you say to people, in this case my professor, who say that you can't separate culture from Islam? They'll give the example of, um, he gave an example of uh, the Sunnah of planting a date tree. He said in Indonesia, date trees don't grow well, so their way of following the Sunnah is planting a coconut tree. That fulfills the same Sunnah, he would say. So what do you say to people like that? Well, the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has some specific some necessary, literal, the Sharia in general, has literal commands and general commands. There are literal commands. How we slaughter the meat is a literal command. Okay? How the, the Arabs cooked the meat is cultural. Right? <coughs> but the literal command is you must slaughter the meat. That's not changing anywhere. The literal command is we must cover our aura. 
These are literal commands. These are never changing. But then the how of them, the hey of it, the, the way in which it's done, it can change. Then you have general commands. The general commands, brush your teeth, clean your mouth, right? Brushing your teeth fulfills that sunnah, whether you use a toothbrush or a miswak. It adds to it if you use a miswak because it's showing your connection to the Prophet. But f- brushing your teeth also fulfills the sunnah, right? So, uh, so there are general commands. And if the idea of trees is valuable, well, why did the Prophet plant a date tree? Is it because of trees or because of the literal date? That's maybe up for interpretation. So we have to ask, is the commandment of the Prophet literal and limited to this specifically, or is it something general? Right. And where it's general, then it could be open-ended. Where it's literal, it has to be that. But also some facets of it are going to be general. Slaughter the meat, necessary. How you cook it, it's going to be different. Yes. Uh, do you actually not like Iqbal? <laughs> I never even read the English, to be honest with you. <laughs> but I like the concept of opening up a country for Muslims and all that. He, he had a lot of good ideas. Yes. So, um, expanding on what you said about vetting like a teacher. Um, Say again? Like you, you talked about how we all have the intellect to vet a teacher for us. Yes, you all have the intellect to find who is most worthy of following and learning from. <coughs> I wanted to ask you on like three things. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on the place of Allah Azza wa Jal? If he's amongst his creation or if he's above the arsh? Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on the speech of Allah, the Quran being the speech of Allah? What are your thoughts about like the, the names and attributes of Allah, you know, um, whatever, um, I guess the right word we look her for all that he has, that he said, like for example, in the Quran, Allah talks about having a face, and this word, and um, you, you mentioned that the, our referee interpreting the Quran yeah. would be the um, what the what was known to the Arabs. Correct. Yeah. And the, um, the word that he used, like, yeah, there, there's a whole big discussion on. Like, what are your, I'm not trying to like debate, but what are your thoughts on these three? These three things. Three okay. Things? I didn't expect this at NYU. <laughs> <laughs> I expected some things, but not this. <laughs> okay, now, to answer your question, that I don't have any thoughts on this. We're muqallids. This is These are questions from mujtahids. Right? Imams. Muqallid is somebody who says, I, I'm not going to derive some ruling by myself. We have a reset level of knowledge. All I can do is assess who is the most most worthy of following and then follow them and understand what they said and transmit it to others, right? The conclusions and the evidences. So on the questions that you asked, all of the questions of you that you asked didn't come up in the first few generations. So therefore we won't find the answer in those books. They come up in the later generations. Okay? And from them 